news to the Morehouse School of Religion. My name is Cheryl Price and I am the publisher at Judson Press. It is truly an honor to be here to celebrate with you and to know what a wonderful blessing you have been and are to the community, the community of faith, the community at large, that you have for 150 plus years helped to shape the minds, hearts, and souls of those who will preach, teach, and witness God's word. We are happy to be a part of this celebration. We want to thank Dr. Evans, who is one of our authors at Judson Press. His recently published book, The Polished King, is available on JudsonPress.com. And so with Dr. Evans and each of you, we know that you will continue to step forward and live in the Word of God as you reach out to many in the community, the nation, and the world. Again, thank you from Judson Press, part of the American Baptist Home Mission Society. We bring our greetings and want you to know we are with you now and forever. Thank you. God bless. Good evening. I'm Joseph Evans. I serve as the Dean of the Morehouse School of Religion, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the 128th annual Founders Day for the Morehouse School of Religion. And in this particular segment, we are prepared to listen to Dr. Marla Frederick as she delivers the C.D. Hubert Lectures, which is one of the highest honors in historically black colleges and universities, particularly in religious education. But before we turn to Dr. Frederick, I simply want to thank Judson Press, as well as the American Home Mission Societies for their willingness and effort to support the Morehouse School of Religion. And in turn, would you please go to Judson Press? Uh, Judson Press is one of the finest press in the country. And we would like for you to go there and uh, look up some of our books and uh, purchase them. In addition, the Home Mission Societies of the American Baptists, as you know, has many resources that help so many people across the country. And we're very proud of our relationship with the American Baptist families. Now back to the C.D. Hubert Lectures. We're very privileged tonight to have with us the Asa Griggs Professor of Religion and Culture of Candler School of Theology at Emory University. Of course, I have alluded to, but now I want to formally talk about Dr. Marla Frederick and she is one of the leading scholars, religious scholars in the country. She's much sought after as a lecturer and a speaker. It is our privilege to have her with us tonight. We believe that she's the right person at the right time to speak to us from a vantage point that otherwise many of us would not be exposed to. And lastly, she's from South Carolina, y'all. She knows how to talk to us. <laughs> and we're very privileged to have her. Dr. Marlon. I can't tell you how much I'm privileged to be able to introduce you to the Morehouse School of Religion family and by extension to the Interdenominational Theological Center. And since you're a Spelmanite, I think you'll be able to talk to us in ways that we'll point to absolutely enjoy. So without further ado, Dr. Marla Frederick, thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Evans, for the very kind and generous introduction. It is indeed my honor to serve as the C.D. Hubert Lecturer for 2022. It is indeed a great honor to celebrate Morehouse's Founders Day, Morehouse School of Religion Founders Day with you. I wanna speak from the subject, the courage to build black religion and the development of historically black colleges and universities. In his inaugural book on black education in the United States, Fugitive Pedagogy, Carter G. Woodson, and the Art of Black Teaching, teaching historian Jarvis Givens writes, Black education was a schooling project set against the entire order of things. This is something we must be clear about in its resounding assertion that Black people were rational subjects that they were not simply hands without a head, captive laborers with no capacity for reason. Black education has been a persistent disruption to the known world instituted through racial chattel slavery. This is the assertion embedded in the abolitionist David Walker's claim 
that for colored people to acquire learning in this country makes tyrants quake and tremble on their sandy foundation. It anchors Frederick Douglass's incisive observation that knowledge unfits a child to be a slave. Fugitive pedagogy was the pursuit of an otherwise arrangement of the world and what it meant to be human. For Givens, the fugitivity of Black education was that it was done in spite of unyielding racial hostility and often under the most surreptitious and precarious of circumstances. Religion scholars have long framed Black religion as a paradigm that sits along a continuum between protest and accommodation. While challenging the paradigm as too binary, not giving space for nuance or overlap and change over time, the fundamental idea that Black religion embodies, at least in part, some element of protest remains. The Black theological project itself emerges with an insistence on the rejection of racism, classism, sexism, and other forms of oppression. Sherman Jackson, scholar of Black Islam, writes definitively that Black religion is protest religion. If we take some element of protest as central to the Black religious project, we must then question the ways in which protest is consistently framed in terms of slave revolts, abolitionism, the civil rights movement, and contemporary Black Lives Matter movement struggles. In his canonical book, Black Religion and Black Radicalism, for example, Garrett Wilmer frames Black Radicalism almost exclusively in terms of faith-inspired slave revolts and the movements for civil rights and Black power. Education, strikingly, as protest, as radical, as counter to the established order, rarely shows up. When it has, and in, as in Hans Beyer and Mel Singer's work, they suggest that the building of colleges and universities by mainstream Black denominations was acquiescence to the status quo of the American capitalist project, insufficiently exploring the ways in which the education of Black people itself was a revolutionary project. The building of Black educational institutions, a demonstration of Black resistance and radical thought. In this paper, I want to reframe our understanding of the building of Black educational institutions by Black religious organizations and white religious organizations as radical, countercultural, and central to the pursuit of justice sought by Black religious leaders. Furthermore, I contend that the ongoing struggle for their full and equitable funding is part and parcel of the ongoing work of justice we face today. As a scholar of African-American religion and culture, to tell the story of Black life, Black struggle, Black progress, is to tell the story of Black institutions. This point is not merely a romantic ideal, but it is a statement punctuated by history. In his work, The Negro Church in America, written originally as a series of lectures in 1953, noted sociologist E. Franklin Frazier describes the Black church as a nation within a nation. After emancipation and during the height of racial segregation, it was the place out of which the Black community, Black community life was forged and synergized. Indeed, the Black church served as the nexus for the expansion of Black education and Black businesses. Although some Black businesses, schools, and religious institutions were established prior to the Civil War, largely in Northern free states, these institutions only blossomed even more after emancipation. If the Black church was established in South Carolina in the early 1700s, the first Black denomination in the United States, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, was established in 1816 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, emerging from the Free African Society in 1787. From the African Methodist Episcopal Church emerged the first Black journal, the AME Review, publishing articles on religion, politics, history, and world events. With the blossoming of Black institutions in the late 1800s and early 1900s, their call and challenge was clear. Set against a backdrop of exclusion, 
race men and race women responded to the pressing needs of the day. As Du Bois opined in his now classic essay, The Conservation of Races in 1897, quote, it is our duty to conserve our physical powers, our intellectual endowments, our spiritual ideals. As a race, we must strive by race organization, by race solidarity, by race unity, to the realization of that broader humanity which freely recognizes differences in men, but sternly deprecates inequality in their opportunities of development. For the accomplishment of these ends, we need race organizations, Negro colleges, Negro newspapers, Negro business organizations, a Negro school of literature and art, and an intellectual clearinghouse for all these products of the Negro mind, which we may call a Negro academy. Not only is all of this necessary for positive advance, it is absolutely imperative for negative defense. Let us not deceive ourselves at our situation in this country, hated here, despised there, and pitied everywhere, our one haven of refuge is ourselves. And but one means of advance, our own belief in our own great destiny, our own implicit trust in our ability and worth. There is no power under God's high heaven that can stop the advance of 8,000 honest, earnest, inspired, and united people. Du Bois's concretization of race through his insistence that as a race, Blacks strive by race organization, by race solidarity, by race unity, to the building up of Negro colleges, Negro newspapers, Negro business organizations, a Negro school of literature and art, amplifies the strict confines of the moment. Without access to white schools, ownership of white businesses, or management of white newspapers, African Americans were abandoned and excluded from the American project and relegated to the status of second class citizens. To own one's own was to inch towards progress, to realize the dreams of young men and women and children. For Du Bois, as for Mary McLeod Bethune, as for countless other race men and race women, fiercely dedicated to the collective advance of Black people emerging from the bowels of slavery, ensconced in the reality of sharecropping and confounded by the putrid system of American racism, the only possibility for racial progress was reliance upon Black solidarity through the development of Black institution. Their call then was aspirational and strategic. It relied upon the type of social conditions that made Black institutions indispensable to the progress of Black people at that time. Not only, as Du Bois insisted, were they, were they necessary for positive advance, but quite strikingly, he opines, they are absolutely imperative for negative defense. Black institutions, in his mind, were responsible for helping to advance the cause and work of Black people, but they were also there to ward off the attacks of a hostile white world. Through these institutions, Black communities were able to educate young Black minds, provide for the basic necessities of the community, as well as organize protest against the Jim Crow South. Black institutions were indeed charged with serving dual purposes. And it is a deliberate deliberate query upon that vision that amplifies our discussion today. As 21st century scholars of African-American life and culture, we tend to spend a significant amount of time telling the stories of individuals, of movements, of cultural trends, but seemingly less time discussing the work of institution building. And while there's a great aversion to institutions, even a distrust of institutions, sometimes particularly among young people. To tell the story of the role of Black religion in the development of Black educational institutions, however, is to do at least three different and very important things. First, it is to tell the story, to tell the story in a more nuanced way 
is to tell a more egalitarian story of Black community development. Secondly, to tell these stories is to highlight the role of Black religious institutions in the work of Black education, to highlight the radicality of churches building Black schools in the post-war era, and unsettle the notion that Black education, whether industrial or liberal arts, was simply part of the mainstreaming of Black America. In so doing, such an analysis further marks the ways in which both a white evangelical faith and a Black faith praxis historically worked for radical advance in the United States. Third, it is to wrestle with the history of economic disadvantage faced by Black institutions and help us to imagine a more just system of higher education moving forward. First, telling the story of Black institutions helps us to tell a more egalitarian story by turning the focus of our research away from, for a time, the charismatic leader, often the male pastor, preacher, or president, and to attend to the everyday people who have helped to make institutions vibrant. In doing so, this type of research demands that we move Black women more to the center of our queries, as they have done much of the sacrificial work in bringing these institutions to life. In surveying the extent of Black-owned property in the early 1900s, Du Bois once opined, despite the noisier and more spectacular advance of my brothers, I instinctively feel and know that it is the five million women of my race who really count. At the time, Du Bois estimated that women raised three-fourths of the money used to acquire church property. And this was not uncommon. For example, in the founding of the First Baptist Missionary Church and Morris College in Sumter, South Carolina, Du Bois's proclamation rings true. One cannot tell the story of the church's founding or Morris College's founding without pointing to the sacrificial work of women in the community. Three women former and free issue slaves, Mary Mitchell, Minnie Blair, and Tilda Bush, established the First Baptist Church in Sumter, South Carolina in 1868, just three years post-emancipation, while meeting under a tree. By 1877, they had built their own edifice. Out of First Baptist came the Baptist State Convention and from there, Morris College. So by 1909, Morris College was established as the first Black Baptist college in the state of South Carolina, founded by Black folks for Black folks. Morris is different than Benedict College in Columbia, South Carolina, another Baptist school, because Benedict was established by white missionaries from the White Northern Baptist Association, who were engaging in this type of social gospel work as well. What is telling about the women's role in the story of Morris College are the minutes of one of the Baptist educational and missionary meetings. According to a wonderful book about South Carolina Baptist women's work, Born to Serve, in 1906, the South Carolina Women's Baptist Educational and Missionary Convention received a recommendation from the male-led Baptist Educational and Missionary Convention that it become an auxiliary to the men's organization in order for it to be, quote, in harmony with the National Baptist Convention and all other state Baptist conventions. The Baptist Educational Missionary Convention also recommended that the Women's Baptist Educational and Missionary Convention turn over all of its money to help the Baptist Educational Missionary Convention carry on its work. The Women's Baptist Educational Missionary Convention's committee had been for years raising money for the primary purpose of supporting the development of the Morris College campus. And so, upon receiving the recommendation 
from the Baptist Educational and Missionary Convention, the Women's Committee on Recommendations responded with the following statement. Feeling that while it may be right for our convention to unite with our Brethren's Convention of this state, that at the present time, it would not be the expedient thing to do. We ask, therefore, that the recommendation from the various sources asking for said cooperation or union be tabled indefinitely. Translated, we don't really know what y'all are trying to do with our money. We don't know why you need our money, but we're about the business of trying to build Morris College. And so to attend to Du Bois's observation, we cannot tell the full story of the building of Black institutions, and particularly educational institutions, without telling the story of men and women's labor, without telling the story of those who work day in and day out, the everyday people who sacrifice to bring these institutions to life. For historically Black colleges to close in this present day is in many ways to close history on black women's labors. Secondly, to focus on black institutions is to highlight the role of religious institutions in the work of black education. And in so doing, mark the ways in which both a white evangelical faith and a black faith practice, praxis historically worked for racial advance in the United States. Furthermore, it is to highlight the radicality of their efforts in the post-war era. Historically, Black colleges and universities were founded largely during the period immediately after the Civil War and before 1910, though some earlier schools were founded in the North before the Civil War ensued. Yet these schools were founded largely under duress. As Jarvis Givens notes, after the Civil War, and especially in the decades following the end of Reconstruction, Black education in the South was violently suppressed or starved of adequate state funding and left to perish. Between 1866 and 1876, well over 600 Black Southern schools were burned. At the turn of the 20th century, Du Bois described White's fierce opposition to Black education as having, quote, showed itself in ashes, insult, and blood. These schools were developed in the midst of white Southern violence and aggression levied by Southern Christians and their organizations. Formerly enslaved persons, unable to attend white universities, and in need of education and skills to survive, pool their minimal resources together through the aid of Black religious bodies, white Northern missionaries, and eventually with government funding for land-grant institutions, over 100 historically Black colleges and universities were eventually established. In 1965, the U.S. Congress gave the colleges special designation as historically Black colleges and universities. Three schools, each founded by Protestant communities, contend for the designation of the first HBCU. Cheney University was founded in 1837 as a school and later turned into a college. It was originally named the African Institute and renamed the Institute for Colored Youth. Cheney was founded through a $10,000 donation from Quaker philanthropist Richard Humphreys. In 1854, John Miller Dickey, the white pastor of Oxford Presbyterian Church in Oxford, Pennsylvania, founded Ashman Institute for the Collegiate and Theological Education of Negro Young Men. It was later named Lincoln University in 1866 in honor of assassinated President Abraham Lincoln it was started as a college. So they contend that they are the first HBCU. And finally, Wilberforce University established in 1856 was the first black college founded by African-Americans. 
was originally established in 1855 by the Methodist Episcopal Church. And then the AME Church bought Wilberforce from the Methodist Episcopal Church and newly incorporated the institution in July of 1863. AME Bishop Daniel Payne became America's first black college president. Each of these earliest schools emerged from the vision of people in religious community. Often the drive to establish schools emerged from a compelling conviction to train pastors and missionaries, but also for the desire to train, to train teachers to educate the masses. Morehouse College was one of these distinguished institutions. Morehouse, along with Spelman College and Atlanta University, were started by white missionaries from the North who endured the hostilities of white Southerners to continue their project of education. Originally chartered in Augusta, Georgia as the Augusta Institute by William Jefferson White in 1867, Morehouse was eventually resettled in Atlanta, Georgia as the Atlanta Baptist Seminary in 1879. With help from the American Baptist Home Mission Society, one of a few white Northern religious organizations that helped to establish black colleges in the South, Morehouse joined with Spelman College and Clark College in 1920 to form the Atlanta University Center, later expanded to include Atlanta University, Morris Brown, Morehouse School of Religion, Morehouse School of Medicine. The simple narrative of Morehouse's founding, however, belies the real challenges faced by the college in its early days. While still located in Augusta, one of the white missionaries from the North who came South to help offer instruction at the school, Mr. Corey, reported that, quote, the times politically were unsettled. Prejudices were strong, and with few facilities, not very much was accomplished. I had some warnings from the Ku Klux Klan, and on a few occasions, the city authorities, unsolicited by me, sent some policemen to protect our evening school. Shortly thereafter, in 1870, Reverend Siegfried and his wife arrived to aid with the instruction and leadership at the Augusta Institute. The times, however, quote, were critical and frequently dangerous for white people engaged in teaching Negroes, opines one historian of the college. After learning of a piece that Reverend Siegfried wrote in a Northern newspaper, quote, telling of the mistreatment of the Negro people of the city, he was forced to leave Augusta, and for a second time, the work of the Augusta Institute was suspended. As Adam Harris notes in The State Must Provide, not only were white missionaries who came South threatened by physical force and violence when attempting to educate Blacks in the South, but state legislatures also actively passed legislation banning whites from instructing Blacks in some states thus enacting strict fines and punishments for those who did. White teachers and leaders at black colleges, however, were not without their own internal conflict. As Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham notes in Righteous Discontent, although they worked for black education, many white Northerners held deeply paternalistic and what Curtis Evans describes as romantic racialist views of blacks. Quote, reports of Northern Protestant societies often emphasize that Blacks were in the childhood state of racial development and were people of, quote, low civilization. Thus, with the founding of schools, white Northern missionary associations often largely employed white leaders and instructors at the schools they founded in the South. African Americans thus waged powerful power struggles in all of the schools established by Northern white Protestant denominations, desiring to have greater control and influence over the schools that educated their students, among them schools like Howard, Morehouse, and Spelman. And although white Northern missionaries were important to the work, Black educators remained central. To emphasize the importance of Northern missionary work in post-war freedmen's education, writes Ralph Luker, is not to deny other important forces in that work, 
Black denominations and the freedmen themselves played a more important role in the effort than official reports or financial calculus can suggest. They were particularly important in establishing Sunday schools in Black churches, promoting literacy and Christian education throughout the South. Martin Luther King Jr.'s grandfather, for example, Adam Daniel Williams, received his only formal education from a Black preacher in the Sunday school of a Black Baptist congregation in rural Green County, Georgia. The importance of Northern missionary institutions lay in their dominance of normal school education, that is, in teaching the teachers. Throughout the history of Black higher education, four groups of people were generally vested in the development of Black colleges. White Northern Christian missionary abolitionist groups like the American Missionary Association, Black Christian denominations, Northern industrialists looking for laborers and philanthropists, and the federal government. With the assistance and encouragement of Negro churches and Black education associations, historian Bobby, Bobby Levitt writes, nearly 800 schools for Negroes were established 45 years after slavery. By 1910, 119 of the schools had become four-year colleges. A self-study provided by Northern philanthropists led to a great purge of schools identified as colleges. After the study, several Black leaders downgraded their school from a college to a normal, quote, teaching, teacher training two-year college. Approximately 119 of the 240 Negro institutions of higher education counted by the studies in 1910 became four-year colleges. There are approximately 107 remaining today. These institutions started as, as were founded by black land grant institutions. Their black land grant institutions were established under the second Morrill Act of 1890, which required former Confederate states to establish universities for blacks given that the first Morrill Act of 1862 had created land-grant institutions across the country for whites, places like Clemson University, the University of Georgia, North Carolina State University, University of Tennessee, Auburn University, Texas A&M. The concession for the second set of colleges in the South was met to ensure that Black people would not demand integration into state-supported white land-grant colleges. So Black land-grant colleges include colleges like Alabama A&M, Alcorn State, Central State, Delaware State, Florida A&M, Fort Valley State, Kentucky State, Langston University, Lincoln University, North Carolina A&T, Prairie View, South Carolina State, Southern University, Tennessee State, Tuskegee University, University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, Virginia State University, and West Virginia State University. Land-grant colleges were a particular designation for the founding of historically Black colleges through the 1890 Second Moral Act, the Second Moral Act of 1890. But private colleges were also established by church denominations. In addition to these land-grant institutions, several colleges were established by denominations and non-denominational entities like the American Missionary Association. Of those colleges established by religious entities, the AMA, American Missionary Association, was at one point one of the most active developers of Black educational institutions. The American Missionary Association was established in 1846 as a non-denominational Christian agency to protest against the comparative silence of other missionary societies with regards to slavery. The AMA emerged out of groups who united to represent enslaved persons aboard the Amistad ship. After their successful defense of these persons, they organized the AMA to expand educational opportunities for black people. From 1867 to 1904, the AMA aided 66 historically black colleges and universities among them schools like Atlanta University, Dillard University, Fisk University, Hampton, Howard, Houston Tillotson, Lemoyne, Talladega, 
in Tougaloo. The Methodist Episcopal Church raised more than $9.2 million between 1896 and 1907 to support Freedmen's education. They aided 22 institutions, 13 of them colleges. Today, those colleges still exist in the United Methodist Church at, at 11, supports the highest number of HBCUs of any major denomination. Bennett College, Bethune-Cookman College, Claflin University, Clark Atlanta University, Dillard, Houston Tillotson, Meharry, Payne College are among the schools supported by the Methodist Episcopal Church. Again, the Presbyterian Church North, the American Catholic Church um, established one Catholic historically black college founded Xavier University founded in 1915 in New Orleans. It was established by Mother Catherine Drexel and her two sisters who had helped to found other schools for Native Americans and African Americans in the North. Drexel formed a congregation of sisters to help her in these efforts, whose order became known as the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. The Disciples of Christ, the American Baptist Home Mission Society, based in New York, also heavily supported the development of Black schools. And Black Baptists in the South established some schools on their own. Black churches were actively involved in the development of schools. As I mentioned, Morris College in South Carolina is one of the Baptist schools founded by Black Baptists in South Carolina. The AME Church the development of black colleges by black churches is particularly remarkable given the unabashed racial hostility of white Southerners. With little to no money, black communities established churches and out of those churches, schools. With the establishment of the AME Church in 1816 as the first black denomination, they were able to establish the first black college founded by black people, Wilberforce, as I mentioned earlier. They eventually established several other colleges, seven of which remain today. Allen University, Edward Waters College, Morris Brown College, Paul Quinn College, Payne Theological Seminary, Shorter College, and Wilberforce University. The AME Zion Church founded at Livingstone College and Clinton Junior College, the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church established Lane College and Miles College and Texas College, men and women of the early church were committed to the development of a better life for African-Americans through institution building. They built churches and schools, helped establish burial societies and support black businesses. As historian Joseph Washington jestingly yet seriously notes, in the beginning was the black church and the black church was with the black community and the black church was the black community. Black church was in the beginning with the black people. All things were made through the black church and without the black church was not anything made that was made. In the black church was life and the life was the light of the black people. The black church still shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. On the heels of emancipation, freed men and women and their descendants were committed to what they believed to be God's work despite the circumstances and because of the great need surrounding them. To write Black religious history is to capture the foundational role of church churches played in the development of HBCUs and to understand their investment as demonstrative of their resistance to the status quo of America's racial caste system. What is troubling about the schools founded by African Americans is that even today, they tend to be the less resourced of the historically black colleges and university compared to those founded by white missionaries from the North. The long history of racial inequality showing up on the balance sheets of our institutions. The third and finally, the study of historically black colleges and universities allows us to contend with the history of economic inequality that infuses our lived experience. In September of 2017, the history of race in America's educational system was placed in sharp relief. Georgetown University announced that in 1838, Jesuit priests sold 272 enslaved persons in order to keep open the doors of Georgetown, the premier Catholic institution in the country. 
While it came as a surprise to many, this revelation was not a surprise for scholars like Craig Stephen Wilder, who in his book, Ebony and Ivory, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities, argues that, quote, the first five colleges in the British American colonies, Harvard, established in 1636, William and Mary, 1693, Yale, 1710, Codrington, 1745, and New Jersey, 1746, were instruments of Christian expansionism, weapons for the conquest of indigenous peoples and major beneficiaries of the African slave trade and slavery, end quote. In fact, the long history of the American university system from Harvard to Georgetown to Duke and countless colleges in between is rooted in American slavery. The financial, social, and structural benefit that these colleges enjoy in compounded interest from the money raised, the services rendered, and the business relationships established yields benefits, some might say 30, 60, and 100-fold decades after the formal end of chattel slavery. And yet this is the history of many predominantly white institutions. The lingering question remains, however, how do we understand the history of historically black colleges and universities in light of this racialized history? The very fact that many white institutions were established upon the subjugation of black people Unlike many leading predominantly white institutions that were founded before the Civil War and benefited from the profits of the North Atlantic tr slave trade, the majority of HBCUs were founded, as we discussed earlier, after the war to educate the formerly enslaved. PWIs thus wrestle with how to be responsible with their large endowments given their seedlings in human trafficking. Schools like Georgetown, Harvard, Princeton, William & Mary, Duke, and even Emory have over the past several years launched initiatives to study their university's history of slavery, and several national conferences have been organized for people to wrestle with these histories. HBCUs, in the meantime, are paying a steep penalty for bearing the legacy of the formerly enslaved and legally segregated. We cannot come to a full understanding of historically black colleges and universities and the particular challenges they face in the 21st century unless we understand them and their founding in the context of America's racial history. And when history is the present, what role do we understand race and racism to play in the ongoing challenges HBCUs face. To look at the endowments of historically black colleges and universities in relationship to the endowments of predominantly white institutions is to look in the mirror of America's racial history. If the history of wealth inequality can be told through the financial positions of individuals and families, with white families holding $100 in wealth for every $5.04 held by black families, it is amplified on the spreadsheets of our institutions. While schools like Bennett and Spelman were educating teachers and nurses and missionaries, the primary careers and positions open to black women in the 19th and early 20th century, white institutions were educating not only everyday professionals, but also legacy captains of industry and power brokers at every level of government and the private sector. The schools with the largest endowments do not necessarily have the highest rates of alumni giving. They have higher capacity donors whose wealth has been largely built along these racial fault lines. The social stations and financial capacities of HBCU graduates of the 20th century relegated the vast majority of graduates into the middle class, not the wealthy class, and this fact is laid bare in our giving. I first came to fully appreciate the history of this structural inequality and institutional disadvantage when I earned my BA from Spelman and went on to Duke for graduate school. I started receiving my newsletters from Spelman and then my newsletters from Duke, and the difference in giving was striking. I would receive a spell messenger, and on the cover, there'd be a picture of the president of 
along with someone from say Coca-Cola. And there'd be huge, a huge replica check and the storyline would read, Coca-Cola donates 500,000 to Spelman. And it would be amazing. Students would have scholarship, faculty, research funds. And then I would receive my newsletter from Duke. And on the cover, one alumnus would give 15 million, turn the page, another 10 million, another 5 million. The two cost contrasting images place wealth inequality and structural racism in sharp relief. Racism is not only about what has been done and what is being done, but it is also about the cumulative effects of historic actions. In this way, what we term institutional racism is demonstrated by the ways in which racism has undergirded the uneven establishment and development of institutions and the ways in which the ongoing economic consequences of a racial caste system bears fruit in the ongoing funding of such institutions. If we look at the largest endowments of white universities compared with the largest endowments of historically black colleges and universities, we can see the difference immediately. Harvard University is an over, over $40 billion endowment. The University of Texas, $30.8 billion. Yale University, $29 billion. Stanford, $21 billion. Princeton, $20 billion. And these, these numbers have changed over the last two years. The largest HBCU endowments are valued in millions. Howard University, a $700 million endowment. Spelman, $390 million. Hampton, $282 million. Meharry, $159 million. Florida a and $98 million. There are at least 100 PWIs that have endowments totaling over $1 billion including schools like Duke and Emory, Michigan, Columbia, Notre Dame. There's not one historically black college with a $1 billion endowment, not one. Put another way, endowments across historically black colleges totaled 2.1 billion in 2019. Endowments across all HBCUs totaled 2.1 billion in 2019. While 54 PWIs held more than $2 billion in their individual coffers, according to one assessment. Historically, black colleges and universities' median endowment value is less than half of that of an industry-wide measure. And that's not by accident. That's by design. There's something of a tragic irony that in this moment where schools that once benefited from the slave trade are wrestling with what to do with their largesse, what to do with their histories, given their gains in human trafficking, while several of the schools that were built by and for formerly enslaved persons struggle and often stand at the brink of closure because they don't have sufficient endowments. The schools of former slaves and the schools of former slave owners have strikingly different trajectories in the 21st century. To put it more bluntly, should the schools of former slave owners thrive while the schools of former slaves close? What do we make of these educational institutional pasts, presents, and futures? And how do we correct such deeply enshrined inequality? What has been exciting to watch over the past two years in the midst of all of the pain and suffering from the pandemic and from the death of George Floyd and the ensuing protests has been the declaration from corporations and business leaders that Black Lives Matter and in that Black institutions matter. I was heartened to see that Netflix CEO Reed Hastings and his wife Patty Quillen gave $120 million to HBCUs Mackenzie Scott gave a total of $556 million to HBCUs between July of 2020 and December of 2020. Lemoyne Owen College received the largest gift in their history of $40 million from the Community Foundation of Greater Memphis. Michael Bloomberg pledged $100 million to four historically black college 
medical schools, Meharry, Howard, Morehouse, and Charles Drew schools of medicine. And several other philanthropists have continued to invest in these institutions and their students, inevitably working to close the gap in their funding. These are great indicators of hopefully a shifting tide and how major philanthropists think about where their donations should go. And HBCUs, at least in this moment, are increasingly a part of that equation. This would be philanthropy helping to rectify history. One might also think about the ways in which government policies could help alter the trajectories of HBCUs, especially given the hostile conditions under which they were founded and the legacy of enslavement and Jim Crow that the government sanctioned. Some of this reckoning can be seen in the outcome of the lawsuits in Maryland and Tennessee. In April of 2021, after years of legal wrangling, Maryland reached a $577 million settlement to end a 15-year-old federal lawsuit that accused the state of providing inequitable resources to its four historically Black colleges and universities. The resources are to be paid out over a 10-year period. In Tennessee, a bipartisan legislative committee determined that the state had failed to fund Tennessee State University in match land grants since the 1950s. After withholding funding for decades, the state of Tennessee owes Tennessee State University a public HBCU potentially well over $500 million. Even when philanthropy and hopefully the soon resolution of these two cases, HBCUs tend to suffer the fate of churches and businesses in our economy. Large, known and easily accessible ones thrive while smaller ones too often suffer longer and close faster. Spellman, Howard, Hampton, Morehouse continue to receive major don donations and that's a good thing. But that happens while Bennett, Wiley and Morris are equally doing yeoman's work in educating first generation college and low income students on comparatively limited funds. As a religion scholar, it has been interesting to note that during this pandemic, many mega churches have actually grown as they have been able to attract new members from across the country who watch their sleek, well-appointed online messages, while rural, small, underfinanced churches struggle to keep community with even their local members. Similarly, in industry, the larger businesses thrive, Walmart, Lowe's, Amazon, while mom and pop shops close. The pandemic has certainly exacerbated these trends and these trends face us too at HBCUs. The great and courageous work launched by leaders like William Jefferson White and carried on by trailblazers like Charles Du Bois Hubert, Benjamin Elijah Mays, Mordecai Johnson, Mary McLeod Bethune, Booker T. Washington, Frederick Humphreys, Janetta B. Cole, my president while at Spelman, and countless others, has not only dramatically transformed the possibilities for Black Americans, but it has reshaped the American landscape and left an indelible mark on the world. The very courageous work that religious institutions embarked upon well over 100 years ago continues to bear fruit today. Certainly Du Bois and his call for the development of Negro schools to study Negro problems never quite imagined the extraordinary impact of historically Black colleges and universities in all of our lives. 2022 looks strikingly different from the late 1800s and early 1900s, in no small part because of these institutions. Nevertheless, their work remains critical to the ongoing work we embark on today for education, justice, and democracy. 
As Morehouse celebrates its 128th founding, paying homage to the courage of its founders, I only hope that this generation and future generations will carry forward the great work started not only at Morehouse, but at all of the HBCUs that has given us such a rich legacy and a promising future. Thank you. Thank you. You're really good. I really appreciate it. I do want to ask you just a couple things very quickly. Would you agree from uh, what you have uh, so eloquently put out to us, um, you focused on Black women's narrative. Um, would you agree with me that Black women's narratives, if they are told, doesn't that influence everything else that we will be learning for the next 50 to 60 years? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Would you like to expand on that just for a minute before I let you go? For example, in our field, um, narrative uh, greatly defines what what theological assumptions we can take from any any text or otherwise. So, for me, uh, Black women's narratives being accurately told will really focus our attention on advancing, for example, liberation motifs um, that may be theological, but also anthropological, something I know you know more about than I do. But is, is that, uh, does that sound about right? Yeah, I think what we have done, and I understand it, is we, to, to my point in the lecture, we focus on these leaders, these, 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 these mm -hmm. presidents and pastors, and, mm -hmm. but we have not focused on the people who've actually built movements, who've done the legwork, right? It's it's like the work of the women in Montgomery who helped start the bus boycott. Part of the reason for them starting the bus boycott was in part because women were constant, black women were constantly being assaulted by white men in the town without any type of accountability. And so, what then happens is when Rosa Parks comes to town to start taking notes on this, she's gathering these black women's stories and she does this across the country. And so part of the civil rights history um, that we learn in this wonderful book called At the, At the Dark End of, of the Street is that black people were protesting, not just because we couldn't you know, sit at the lunch counter and we couldn't come through the front door and we couldn't drink at the same water fountains, but black people were protesting, black women were protesting because black women were being sexually assaulted by white men and no one was being held accountable. And so when you start telling black women's histories, the history books open up, the stories open up. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think that's important. And I want to restate that the uh, narrative has a great deal to do with uh, informing a theological uh, point of departure. And if we focus on that, we will be able to advance our liberation theology and motifs. There's just one or two final questions, and that is your focus on the disparities in income and wealth that influences um, how education is delivered, whether it is through accreditations, et cetera, et cetera. But I think more narrowly, at least for my interest, the racial caste systems Wealth and equality in education, I wrote down um, the disparity in the, uh, the endowments. Professor, is there anything that we can do to address that disparity? And if we, and if, and what would that be? And how would we go about it? The disparity is so great. You know, I, ha I have these uh, slides, these images to show the endowments of white institution compared to the endowments of black institutions. The disparities are so great. I don't know that we'll ever catch up as far as parity. Um, 
But what I do know is that the work ahead, and I think this is for those who are interested in justice, whether black or white or whomever, they need to take a look at those histories and decide where um, investment dollars should go. And I think the government has to be responsible in some part for that equitable distribution. I talked about the lawsuits in Maryland and Tennessee. I think several suits, other suits have started in, in other places um, throughout the South. I think that's a part of rectifying that history. But there's a, a long, I mean, because, because the way investment works, you, you build interest over time. You cannot really recapture the, the money that was lost from the interest that you did not capitalize over that period of time. So it's, it's really hard to catch up, but I, I certainly think it's worth the, the effort. And I think that's where justice work needs to go. One final question, hypothetical question. Uh, I asked this of persons of your um, status and professional insights but it's just a theory and I just want to see how you respond to it. In fact, I've asked two, two presidents this question in the AUC. Uh, uh, one institution you would be very, very familiar with, but, I'll, but I digress. And here's the question. If for three years or four years uh, consecutively, <clears throat> each black student that graduates from high school that aspires to go to college. And they employ the Du Boisian general strike that you and I know about that's like on page three in the Black Reconstruction, depending on which copy you get. But what if theoretically all black students refuse to go to uh, a PWI and all of us for four years consecutively, you're smiling, four years consecutively choose to force our ways into, because we only have 105 institutions that we can choose from, and I know the resources and so forth, but what would happen to the academic culture and uh, the academic infrastructure in higher education if that phenomenon of the general strike would take place in your view? That's a striking question. Um, you know, I, I think young people attending historically black colleges and universities, I will say this, um, gain so much beyond the classroom that is intangible, that has everything to do with their outlook on life, their sense of themselves as they're coming into young adulthood, their sense of the world, that really helps, helps to shape who they become in the world. Um, and those resources are abundant at historically black colleges and universities. Um, you can seek them out at PWIs, but they're, they're not necessarily readily available. Um, and so what that can do to young black minds is extraordinary. What it would do for historically black colleges and universities would be tremendous, particularly because so much of our, our, you know, at HBCU, so much of your operation budget is, is built around tuition. Um, but I, I do think that it would have a dramatic impact on the trajectory of young Black intellectuals and leaders. I agree. And I thank you for answering that. I, I think that that is a way that we can have some insurgency into the endowments that seem impregnable at present, we can literally just stop going to their institutions and create research programs so we can attract the top scholars who would rightly and want to work at our institutions if we had the type of resources for them to do their research. Um, but that is a Du Boisian model that I read. Du Bois said, theoretically, if black, if slaves in the uh, during slavery would have seen themselves as workers and went on strike, on one day, it would have ended slavery that day. Of course, again, it's hypothetical, but we have the tools to do those things in our time. I want to thank you again. You know I'm a big fan and it is a privilege to have you with us. I hope that we can work 
uh, and spaces, uh, other spaces where I want to introduce you to, to so many people, brothers and sisters at large and across the country and frankly across the globe who will see this. I want you to know that Dr. Marla F. Frederick is uh, genuinely a very kind, very kind individual with a mammoth mind and incredible abilities. Please um, purchase her books and follow her career and she'll be coming near you as soon as the pandemic is over. Again, I'm Joseph Evans. I serve as the Dean of the Morehouse School of Religion and you and I have had the privilege to listen to Dr. Frederick deliver this 128th annual C.D. Hubert, Charles Du Bois Hubert Lecture of the Morehouse School of Religion. God bless you and thank you once again. Thank you, Dean Evans.